anything. Uh, the emoji uh, section, you can find it actually in the bottom. The, the bottom, you can see like a smiley face emoji. Click, you can see some emoji, click anything you want, right? If you find some content in the middle of the, uh, of the talk, yeah. if you find some uh, content that's like really resonate to you, that you think is like a punchline that the uh, guests speak, then you can also do like a thumbs up or like a heart emoji to like recognize all that too. Have it be like on my sync, my sync with these speakers. And definitely uh, uh, when I end the uh, events, uh, to invite the guests to go back to the uh, audience on the other floor, uh, you guys can also do like an emoji or like a clap hands emoji to really uh, send a, a gratitude uh, for the uh, sharing from the guests. Right. Cool. Without further ado, I'd like to invite uh, Jackson. A little bit background about Jackson. Um, so Jackson is very special among all the guest speakers, right? Uh, he's something very busy, as we kind of know about it. Uh, he's a real serial entrepreneur, we call. Uh, he has been um, making his own companies uh, freshly of college. He found a couple companies. He definitely sold some of them. Um, and now he's really tapping with the uh, front end. Uh, with, with, with the most uh, frontier uh, uh, trend, which is uh, physical plus digital world, we call it a digital, right? I'm not an expert. I'd like to invite Jackson on the stage. Uh, hey guys, last welcome Jackson on the stage by showing your emoji of support. Hi, Jackson. Hey. Uh, thanks, Keith, for the introduction. Appreciate it. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. I know uh, we invite you to do a bit sharing. Do you have materials? Sorry, come come again, Keith. It's a bit yeah. Tricky. I mean, just a really quick check. Uh, have you prepared some materials uh, to present? Oh uh, no, actually, I, I was thought this is more Q and A uh, in that sense, but I could. Cool, cool. The introduction. <laughs> Would you be convinced to actually uh, uh, yeah. switch on your camera, if you don't mind? Great, great. I mean, we, we would like to see the face, the smiley face, even though we're kind of in a metaphor space, right? Um, you guys can definitely, I mean, like for audience who are listening, uh, I'll be the one moderating most of the sections, right? I'll be like casually, uh, just like chilling with a friend. Um, but you guys can ask questions in the chat room. This one room, uh, you can find it on the right bottom of the corner. It's like a chat uh, icon. Click there. You can ask any question you want. Uh, or later on, I can invite you to unmute your, 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 your mic. You can also ask something that related to, to Jackson. Right. So without further ado, uh, first of all, thank you so much for Jackson. I know it's a weekend. It's a Chinese New Year uh, season, right? People are really busy, uh, same as you. Um, so I actually talk quite uh, deeply into your website, also LinkedIn profile. I know there's some very special thing about you comparing to a lot of like people in Singapore, right? Um, you have spent the last about 10 years to really working out on entrepreneurship as a founder in the field of design, art, and photography in coming the area. It's really dumb to ask, but my first question is, how do you find passion? <laughs> wow. That's a big one. And first of all, I apologize for the, the tardiness, right? Uh, it's a, uh... Honestly, it's Chinese New Year, and it's uh, it's a bit uh, crazy right now. So, apologize for 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 the you know time time um, you know that I'm able to be here. But anyway, <clears throat> back to the questions that uh, Keith was asking. So, I, I think it was it was very early on. Like uh, you know, my background is in interactive media, so I do a lot of development work, mostly for games. I would say during school, and then. Post school, you know, in Singapore, we have like the two years of buffer, right, with national service. So we could think a little bit about, you know, what else um, do we want to do and, and, and some time to ponder. But I think my path was meant to be part of an agency. So mostly uh, advertising agency like Oakley or, or Sachi and Sachi and, um, you know, names like that. Uh, the problem with that is uh, I, I don't really, I guess I'm not really into... Uh, trading time for for value in that sense, um, and I just want to go to work um, wherever I want, however I want. So I, this was back in uh, 20, 2012, right? And so, what else could I could I do? And 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 I start looking at uh, a couple of things that I've done before. 
um, that I really enjoy. So I, I love photography. I love, um, you know, designing. So I did a marketplace. I built a marketplace for photographers, uh, those classified stuff that, that, that you do. And I realized that I quickly realized that you need a lot of people to <laughs> ramp it up pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and so during NS, there wasn't a lot of time. So, so I just, I just stopped doing that. Um, I run, I run another branded business. So we, we import in, um, Ukrainian uh, cameras or Russian cameras back then uh, for 50 bucks we sold it for 250 you know that was that was the idea of business anyway at a point of time so you buy low and you sell high so it worked really well for me um, and then I guess when uh, when I came out of, of army which was like uh, maybe 20 2014 or so um, an investor came in and, and invested in that that camera business and so uh, eventually, eventually, uh, you know, I got screwed over and, and basically have zero dollars, um, and it's back to square one. So at a point of time, I was just uh, looking at what I've done and where am I most passionate in, and and one of the things I realized was to um, create with the artists that I love because I, I I do collect a lot of stuff like your toys, your art prints, your um, books from the artists and I wanted to be involved in, in that space that that was for sure right and I, I started to look for a medium that could deliver that and collectibles was one of those things that um, that I was personally very interested in and so we started creating uh, designer uh, collectibles so that was how um, really like uh, through trial and error through the different passions that I have like which one sort of sticks because when you turn your passion into Business is kind of a, a, a different, different, different thing entirely. You know, no, no one. I would say most people don't really want to do it, or, or, sh or you could try, and 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 you know what I mean—the suffering that comes with it, right? But, mm -hmm. but what happens is that when I started working, um, you know, building the business model and 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 subsequent development of the company, um, it began to dawn on me that um, creating brands is is my passion, and so I wasn't bought by it. Like it's something that I could do uh, day in and day out. So, so that was how it came to be. Yeah. Right, right, right. That actually many things to uh, blend together uh, with with your about like ten years okay. experience of entrepreneurship. Okay, can you still learn? How can you still learn? I go take a puppet joking. Okay, I mean like at, at the same time, uh, I feel that's one one thing that you every time when you start a new company would struggle, which is of uh, uh, forming a founding team. Right. I mean, like, um, what were some of the common traits that you, you think when you met a new person or like an old friend that can potentially qualify as being a founding team member or like the co-founder candidate? I, I think um, at the at the most as the most top of priority, uh, you know, for for some businesses would be uh, possibly the experience that they could uh, come with. Right. So in a particular field or industry, I think that's pretty straightforward but for me personally i prefer the mentality of the people who are coming on board so at a different stage of our growth i think whether is it like three percent or, or you know 30 or 40 or you know going to 80 and 100 over 100 people now each of these stage right you require like different kind of um leadership uh, i would say and from the very beginning if you have three person then naturally or ideally, um, every one of them should become uh, leaders at, at some point, point, right? Everybody will buy this don't talk from normal. Was that okay? Keep going, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like house rule. I mean, like I'll ask you guys to actually uh, make comments uh, and stuff. Uh, if you can actually do it on the chat room, I really highly appreciate uh, for that. Uh, we also o open up a little bit for the Q and A section a bit later on. But let's get back to the stage uh, for Jackson, please. Yeah. So. So what happens is that um, usually at, at, at a certain age, um, I started when I was, uh, I think Mighty Jacks was started about, maybe I was 21. And so everyone around me are generally like, uh, well, at that age. And, and, and so experience is off the table, right? Um, mm. And the, the, the desire to create something extraordinary or create something different uh, has to be there so that the, the, the work that's needed to create that you require a lot of uh, 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 really a strong mentality to do it. So I, I, I felt that the the idea, you know, the, the, the vision that they have sharing with uh, the founder, I think that's going to be uh, quite um, 
quite critical um, and the, in, uh, the 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 I guess the integrity of the person and also the drive of the person so so right. quite, quite intangible in a way <laughs> <laughs> it's not all about like um, the, the the chemistry happened with two people but that person can actually uh, having persistence uh, tenacity when they face challenges uh, when people like have money in that in, in, in front of them right something will actually change right um, so um, that's one thing that we, we say quite a lot is the uh, ninety percent of these setups will fail, right? Um, it's this kind of thing, right? And we know that like human relations is a really key factor of failures. Um, I mean, what was some story or like lessons that you learned uh, can handle human relations um, in any point uh, in a startup journey, particularly working with founders. So I've spent 10 years building uh, the company, right? And through this period, I, I think the one thing that, that came out really strongly um, was the relationships. Um, and the relationships drive everything from the failure of the company or the uh, success uh, of it. And the reason why I say it's relationships is both uh, internal and external. Um, your investors, your customers, and, and so on, but internally, uh, it's quite critical as well. And for me, when when we went from three packs to maybe I would say 20, 25 or so, uh, around that size, uh, that was the first um, sort of challenge that I have. Because at, at that size, and, and if you're doing uh, X amount of revenue, uh, at a point of time, I think we were doing maybe three, four million or so. Um, it requires a, 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 a more structured in you know a structured base i would say that infrastructure requires a lot of work to make sure that it could um you know uh, scale uh, accordingly and and when that happened um what you get is usually the people that are with you from the beginning uh would starts to start to sense a, a shift in in the thinking um and putting in structure isn't uh something that uh you know, most people would be comfortable with, right? Um, for the mm. business owner, I think for the C-suites, I, I think that's fine because that, they know exactly where it has to be, but but not everyone, right? And so what you get is most likely, um, you know, people leaving. So I, at the point of time, I think we have uh, 50% to 70% people so just sort of, okay, I, I guess this is not really for, for, for me right now and, and they leave, right? But of course, when they leave, then we have people who are aligned to the new mindset uh, comes in. And so along the way, right now we are like uh, 100, 180 or so. Now, uh, what happens is that there are only, I think, five people that came from that uh, batch or that stage, right? And so managing a relationship uh, also requires you to, uh, as a founder or as a CEO, I, I think, to take on a different, a different approach and hat. Why I say that is because when you have 25 people, you don't really have HR, like... <laughs> This is like sort of non-existence in that way. Everyone's going mm. really, really quickly. But when you're acting as the CEO and you're also the, the HR, uh, now, no matter how impartial you are, it, it almost doesn't matter because uh, generally people would think you have a, a, a certain biasness towards uh, whatever it is, right? And so the perspective or, or, or the emotional part of the uh, team, I think, um, is something has which has been really, really tricky. So we decide to... Um, you know, have a proper HR unit and, and so that everyone's, uh, uh, you know, concerns can be uh, taken care of. But I think that was one got of it. the largest, yeah, for, for me. Got it, got it. I mean, I've been seeing you also like doing some writing articles online. We'll love to hear a lot more story about like, how you handle human people, uh, making operations really cinematic also in a company, maybe on the written form. Uh, we have a lot of people actually asking about toy. I feel like there's some like toys fan uh, actually on the floor. Uh, for me, I actually don't mind to switch on my background. Uh, I have some like figures in my background, actually. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, we also do a bit like introduction about uh, uh, Mighty Jazz if uh, just for people who, who don't know about your company. Sorry, come again. Yeah, will you do a bit intro about your company? Yeah, so Mighty Jacks. Mighty Jacks was um, created simply because we want to build a collectible that you can't get in big, big box stores and we are not um, you know bothered with whether it offends people or not I, I think we're just creating things for ourselves so I, I think that's a true representation of um, I think the current landscape of whether is it political or 
you know, other other form of more out artists that are more out there. So when we created the first figure, it it sold out and 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 it rolled forward and forward and we create more, um, you know, figures now. I think we have about a thousand over um creations uh, to date. Now this figure, these collectibles, right? They generally retail for around. I would say a hundred to five hundred US. Uh, also, that's a retail price point. Um, and increasingly, you know, we have uh, spawn off different categories. So we have ten dollar price point, and we have uh, three thousand uh, dollars price point as well. So they they are all different formats. Uh, they are largely the same working process, which is we work with the artists, we work with the brands. Um, you know, some of the top artists in the world, like uh, Murakami or like uh, James Jean. And for brands, they are like Universal, Warner Brothers, Disney, um, all the all the um, usual suspects in the entertainment space. So what happens is that we create the products and then we distribute them. Um, sometime in 2018, and I, I'm gonna, I think some of your questions here also will 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 be linked to this, right? Uh, in 2018, we were introduced to blockchain, and at a point of time, it's um, you know the authentication of blockchain was mainly used for. Um, I would say fresh produce or other form of high value items uh, in the back end part of things. So the logistical part, which part did it go, things like that. And I, I think that wasn't that wasn't very sexy, right? So uh, the you know the team that that worked with us decide to you know push us in the direction of authenticating from a consumer front. So what we did is that we built a new team um, which solely focused on digital work. And we develop a patent pending chip, which allows us to um, embed into the products at a manufacturing level because we own a manufacturing chain. And so when the consumer receives it, you tap onto it. Um, think of it like a think on be like a Nintendo Amiibo on steroids, right? Pretty much. And and so you tap onto it, you could you know do certain things, registered ownership, things like that. And and from our perspective is that if we are able to understand what kind of IP you like or characters that you like, let's say Stranger Things or, or, or whatever, then we could push the right content uh, to the right people, right? Exclusive products, um, tickets for the premiere, things like that. Um, and so that really got us on a different trajectory, uh, I would say, as opposed to other conventional um, collectibles uh, brands. And... Then we move from strength to strength, and 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 that's when we start um, really the we truly start our venture uh, raise uh, to in that in that period of time, um, and then <clears throat> subsequently extend into the three side of things um, sometime uh, two years back. So that's that's my Jacks. <laughs> right, you just make it like very pretty about how you say the whole story, but I can definitely feel like there's some like challenges when you're breaking into the whole web three world. Uh, one of that is um, since hardware product, it takes a lot of time to develop. Also, like the huge production cost, right? Which is very different from like software uh, uh, startups or solutions, right? Um, when you kind of blend the idea, of making your collect collectibles into Web three elements or NFT and other like interactions element inside, how do you first identify or determine your target audience? How do you kind of like, find a fit in between traditional collectibles owners uh, and people who are kind of in between? Yeah, What's uh, the process? this is a 2.0 to 3.0 type of uh, uh, conversation, right, uh, Keith? Yeah. yeah, so, you know, when we when we started um, doing that with, uh, with the products, I think one of the main challenges is that the education is not there because ultimately that is um, mostly to 2.0 guys, right? And... And they just don't have a habit of doing that to the collectible. <laughs> you don't buy a collectible and you scan it. <laughs> it's, it's something that is still quite uh, foreign in some of the markets that um, we are in. And, and so the conversion wasn't, wasn't that great, right? I, I think anyway from 10 to 30%. Right? Ideally, it should be higher. Um, so what happened was that we started thinking from 3.0 to 2.0, right? What, what does it really mean for, for the brand to go on that direction? And... Actually, the first request for such a collection came from Binance because they needed, um, this, this is the first time they needed, how do I put it, creative talent or, or to, to, to create collections, right? Um, and I segue a little bit and, and, and that's, and mostly it's because of that. That's why 
I think the whole creative uh, industry also got lifted up in that sense because you don't really um, need big brands uh, in that way, right? You can you can be a really talented, um, uh, you know, uh, artist that create the great narrative or, or visuals uh, even to to get a kickstart on on that. So so for us, it was finance, and when we release our first collection, we decided to do a collection because it was almost a no brainer. It's like when we create a collectible, we have to create the digital version of it anyway. And then the physical collection, which takes anywhere from six to nine months to, to be realized. So what it means for us at that point in time was that a digital collection could go to market a, a lot quicker than uh, the physical part. So we did that. And, and it sold out in a few seconds, right? So then the team went back and we we're like, yeah, like um, something's definitely happening, but what do we make of this and how do we want to push it forward, right? And so we got a ton of requests to do collections like that. Um, and the truth is it's, it's, it's tempting. It's tempting to take all the money off the table, right? Um, but we didn't. So we didn't continue the collection. The uh, main reason why was because we wanted to create something that has longevity that could sustain um, in real world users. So that's when the whole idea of utility came about, right? What can you actually do? I, I think mostly 3.0 projects uh, generally have a lot of um, crossovers in, in, in the digital world, which is, which is great. Um, but often when it comes to real world application, then that's when you know, certain projects require certain agency to represent them, to push it out into real world. Because we know that the 2.0 side of things has you know, has a lot more consumers and, 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 you know, collectors that we can tap on, right? That, that is a, that is a fact. And so we decide to extend the use of the NFT in, in real world. And one of the most obvious way to do it was to use it as a, a gantry of, uh, of sort, right? So we launch um, another collection by ourselves um, at, at, um, where was it? Designer Con in, in LA and also Complex Con, which is also in LA. And basically, you buy the, uh, the NFT, then you could have a, a, you know, access to the physical product, of which when you scan the physical product, you get more digital assets. So we, we created a loop, um, a product loop of sort um, by, by, by doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in general, uh, in, in general, I mean, uh, we'll be seeing more and more Web3 uh, uh, solutions that's really plugging with the co collectibles, right? Um, what were some of the advantages or what were some of the really cool uh, cases that you have seen uh, around the whole world that people also think something similar as what you're trying to, to, to do? I think Artifact's pretty much, uh, pretty much the model case study, I would say, uh, in our business. So something that, that ties in um, the digital access to certain uh, physical uh, benefits um, and also digital benefits as well. And if uh, we are able to see how both product is able to appreciate in value too, so then it gives back the value to the to the collectors, right? So artifact probably would be uh, quite quite a close one. Yeah. Yeah. Would that actually affect general like how that influence general public audience? Like, is it only like what you're trying to serve is kind of like people who are really in collectible field, right? And we've been seeing more and more ideas about how to actually apply digital concept into banking, real estate, even retail consumer uh, field, right? I mean, like, do you think the question is like, making make it make a bit like general is like, why should we care about the concept digital? I think in inherently, I think, human beings just require something tangible you know <laughs> i i think the absolute uh in all honesty i think the absolute um digital world that we can possibly live in perhaps it's uh 15 years 20 years from now maybe it's 10 years if you're optimistic but before that happens i think the bridging needs to happen if the bridging happens then the addressable market gets larger and so um it become a, a way of life and i think to be there, to reach that ultimate point, uh, whether it's a real estate or any kind of, you know, true fractionization or, or anything like that, of um, art assets, things like this, you know, these are this will gradually influence the way that we would allocate our funds. I I, I suppose uh, in, in in many ways, mm, but also 
the idea that it doesn't have to be too technical, I feel. Like, a, a lot of it um, originally spawned off from very, very technical uh, sort of perspective. But if we want the mass market um, to be buying into such, uh, uh, you know, concept, then then perhaps, um, you know, terming it or, or introducing it uh, from its function base um would most likely get across to them easier than a certain terminology, and and that's something that we experience um, from from outside. Yeah. Right. Cool. Cool. I mean, uh, for us and for you, it's definitely we are experimenting how to apply Web three to different like uh, areas. Uh, there are definitely many like cool ideas will be born from the audience who are joining in the startup weekend events. Um, we also like expose a little bit, just a little bit, uh, how your company is embracing the change of Web3. Uh, what's your vision um, uh, in the next couple of years uh, in the field of digital? Yeah, so we are bringing it to a physical and digital experiences as well. So I'm talking about um, actual build-ups of um, stuff that we have worked with our brand partners on. So upcoming one will be uh, with Netflix, which is uh, sometime in uh, June or July. Um, it's full immersive experience. You use your NFT ticketing to access a lot of these uh, touch points inside, um, of which it allows you to have exclusive products and then um, access into uh, the different uh, virtual worlds that we have built uh, too. So to facilitate that, we have been working with uh, quite a bit of um, the 3.0 partners as well to to, to build such uh, lens and, and experiences. So, so that's how we have been building it. But also we will untitter ourselves or, or not titter ourselves to uh, what the markets would determine it to be. I think last year has been quite uh, sobering, you know, in, in a way that it could be both the private markets and uh, the public and the, the crypto side of things. And so to to not focus on that, but focus more on the infrastructure of it is uh, of which it serves our uh, consumers best. So that is the the North Star for it. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, since we have time, let me kind of pick some interesting questions uh, from the floor. Uh, let me see. Let me see. Oh, there's one really random question I really like from uh, from Rachel. So, what is the craziest toy you ever made? Whoa. Well. The craziest I've been when making a toy. Let's let's look at this question in two ways, right? The craziest I've been making a toy is with uh, one of the most famous uh, Japanese artists, and it took like three years and four years, and everything is so particular, and 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 all the minute details need to be done. So much so, I think we probably lost money on it, but we still do it because I just love his stuff. Um, so that was uh, frustrating, but uh, fulfilling at the same time. Um, the craziest, the craziest toy that that um, we mean. I I guess to me it's not really crazy because we we do like uh pretty pretty alternative stuff. Um, you know, like uh, whether is it like middle fingers or like a skeleton coming out from a uh naked body things like that so so these are things that we have been quite familiarized with but i'll tell you this my my factory one of our factory that we use in the beginning actually makes uh, sex toys right and and so like um it's it's pretty amazing how that business run because the the material is silicone and is is pretty cheap um but uh, uh, the price point is pretty high so so i would say that uh all kinds of uh, autopus stuff and things like that was that was pretty uh yeah that was pretty wow. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, the other question from the floor is from uh, just uh, Joseph. Uh, so Joseph asked, um, which platform you place it on to launch your products? Does it require a soft launch first? I think he's, he's kind of asking uh, around the digital product when you launch. Um, so for the digital. For the digital side of things, I think mostly it's on based on the marketplace's traction, I would say. Um, of course, it has to be uh, one of the top few projects that they are willing to partner on. Um, and I guess some commercial, you know, breakdown from there for, for their benefit, things like that. So, so that is probably the best bet because the traction comes from 
I would say the traction mostly comes from the marketplaces that the, it's launched on. So that would be the most effective for the digital products. But a physical, digital products part of things, um, really, we we really established like, a, you know, distributors and channels uh, all around the world. So um, what we do is we do some internal testing, like uh, focus groups, things like that, to sort of give feedback on the genre, the styling, um, whether the product work or not. Um, and then it, it goes out to the channels, right? But the truth is, right, I think anything in creative, it's it's really hard to say. Um, and I ever met a, a pretty senior executive from, uh, what was it, Hasbro? Um, and well, I was just checking with him, like, you know, do, do you know how, you know, Transformers became Transformers or Little Ponies become the ponies? The, the truth is no one really knows. With 20 years of experience, no one... <laughs> No one really knows as well, you know. So you could use logic to eliminate some of those, um, but otherwise, uh, it, it should be a pleasant surprise kind of kind of thing. I feel. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. The other question that I I, I mean like, I kind of generate quickly is um, a lot of people actually I mean like like me right we're a little bit like uh, fussy with the with the NFC hype right we purchased a lot of NFC with PFB the metaverse avatar right. Uh, some of the the groups that I uh, I play with the NFT in, uh, they also kind of launch the the uh, uh, figure or like collectibles or like some sort of like the surrounded like physical items uh, to the NFT collectors. Um, is it kind of one of the the channel that you find your projects, or I mean, in general, how do you kind of see this like concept to kind of plug in the both physical and digital uh, elements with, with for the NFT owners? Is it making sense for you? Yeah. So. I think the demand has been there and the demand has been from a grassroots level, right? So I was at uh, NYC, uh, NF, NFT NYC uh, last last year. So a lot of it is grassroots level, you know, smaller smaller companies that's, uh, you know, doing the transition uh, in between uh, physical and digital. For us, we have um, the partners uh, like XC Infinity and so on to, to work with us, uh, reach out to us to, to, to create the physical products uh, in that way. Um, and, and so the, it's two prongs, right? I, I think we have to observe the community reaction to it. And by far, I think it has been quite encouraging. Um, and so we have been investing quite a bit into making it a reality, like something like a Crypto Punk and Tiffany, you know, a kind of a, a bespoke projects like that. Uh, I think that would be pretty insane, you know, if if you could just with a click of button and you just receive it and, and, and you, you could do certain things to it. Yeah. So I definitely believe there's a huge potential for that, yeah. Yeah, we'd definitely love to see some uh, new collectibles that's like part of like the top-notch NFT project. There's you know, like the, the, the big brands very soon. Cool. I mean, um, once again, thank you so, so much from Jackson's uh, sharing. I know time's very limited, uh, but let's find a time, maybe next year, maybe in the next bull run, we'll see you in a Saturday weekend global events. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Guys. Right, take care. Bye. Thank you. And, and, and for you guys, can definitely show like emoji uh, to thank you, uh, Justin, sharing.